Welcome to worship. This Easter season, we've been using the theme victorious. As we've been reflecting on and and celebrating the victory that Christ has won for us by his empty tomb. And today we are using the theme, we have victory no matter what happens in this life. We have that assurance that Christ has won for us that victory. And so that means that, that we get to live in eager expectation of that glory that Christ has won for us. And nothing, right? no trials, no challenges, no tribulations, none of it can dim that glory that Christ has won for us. And once again, if you would like to follow along with the, the service, you can download a worship folder uh, by using the link in the video description just below this video. God's blessings on your worship. We'll begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and fail to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, And by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue with our first lesson. We are continuing our reading through the book of Acts. And uh, today we read about Paul's missionary visit to the city of Athens. We read from Acts chapter 17, and we'll read verses 22 through 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this all men. He has given proof to to all men by raising him from the dead. This is the word of our Lord. Our gospel lesson is Jesus' prayer for his disciples on the night of his betrayal and arrest. As Jesus prepares for his cross and and, and subsequent ascension into heaven, we see that his prayer is for his disciples who are remaining in this world. He prays for them that they might remain strong, steadfast, until that day when, when he brings them with him to be with him in glory. We read from John chapter 17, and we'll read the first 11 verses. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, The time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by contemplating the, by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Our sermon lesson is coming from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, preparedness can make all of the difference. Right, preparedness can, can be the difference between a, a joyful, great experience and a miserable experience. In extreme cases, preparedness could be the difference even between life and death. Some years ago, I went on a camping or back trap, backpacking trip with some friends. And uh, we took this trip into the, the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. And I, I know I've, I've mentioned this, this trip before, but I'm bringing it up now because we were very well prepared for that backpacking trip. We had done all of our research. We researched the, the, best, the best paths to take through the mountains. We researched what kind of climate and terrain we should be expecting. Uh, we, we made our checklist and made sure that we had everything packed that we needed, that that we all had exactly what would fit in our backpacks and had all the gear distributed evenly. We did our research and we, will, we were well prepared. And as a result of that, the trip went very well and, and we had a really good time. Well, three years previous to that, I went on another camping trip with many of those same friends. Only this one we weren't so prepared for. It was kind of a spur-of-the-moment trip. And this, this camping trip was in Arizona. And I guess one of the biggest problems that we weren't prepared for is we didn't have near enough food. And I'll never forget standing around that campfire in a circle, and we were passing around a can of beans we cooked on the fire, and we were each just taking a spoonful and passing it on because that was all we had to eat that night. And I remember going to sleep that night, and it was freezing cold. We weren't prepared. We didn't really check the kind of temperature to be expecting in Arizona. And I think Arizona, I think hot desert. But we were up in, in, I guess, some of the higher elevations, and it got literally freezing cold that night. And I put on every article of clothing that I brought with me in that trip. I put it all on as I went to bed that night, just trying to, to keep warm in my sleeping bag. We weren't prepared, 
and, well, it was miserable. But that's the difference between preparedness and unpreparedness. Well, I, I wanted to focus today on, on preparedness. And, I, and obviously I'm thinking bigger picture than just being prepared for, for say, a camping trip. But are, are you prepared for life in general? Are you prepared for all of the challenges and difficulties and, and unexpected turns that are bound to come in life? You know, it, it's just a reality that the world in which we live is hostile to our Christian faith. We face all kinds of dangers, all kinds of temptations, all kinds of tri trials and challenges to our spiritual life. And those dangers and those challenges, they come really from our three biggest enemies. The devil, the sinful world, and then our own sinful flesh. And so long as we live in this world, those three enemies, they will continue to, to threaten and, and put in danger our spiritual life. So are you prepared? Well, our sermon lesson from 1 Peter in it, we, we see the, the Apostle Peter, he tells us how to be prepared. He tells us how to be prepared so that we can face those enemies and we can meet those challenges and come out victorious, no matter what we face in this life. And the first thing that our lesson calls for in our preparedness is humble trust. It begins, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So what does that mean to humble yourself under God's mighty hand? Well, for one thing, it, it means to humbly accept whatever comes from God's mighty hand with, without complaint or accusation. Or we are to humbly accept God's will and his plan for our lives and whatever he allows to enter into our lives. You know, that, that is the, the tough lesson that, that Job of Old Testament fame learned. After Job lost nearly everything, in a very short period of time, his wife, who was of no help to him at this time, said to him, Job, just curse God and die. In other words, just give up, lose your faith, lose all hope, it's over. Look at what God has done for you. And what does Job say in return? He says, should we accept the good things from God, but but not the trouble. Now, it's important that, that we don't forget the second part of that verse. But the first part, it says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand so that, it says, he may lift you up in due time. You know, many things in this world bring us down, but it is God who, who lifts us up. And he does so in due time, at the proper time. And that proper time, it's according to God's schedule. And again, that's where the humble trust comes in, isn't it? It's according to God's schedule. And it won't be a moment too soon or a moment too late. And all of God's people will be permanently, forevermore, and perfectly lifted up and exalted when Christ returns and when he bestows upon all, the head of all of his people his crown of righteousness. So in the meantime, we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand in joyful anticipation of that day. But for now, it's not as though we have to sit here and, and stoically bear hardship. And, and we have no hope for the present time. And that's not the case at all. all right, listen to the assurance that the next verse gives us. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Well, do you have any anxiety? And what a time for that question, right? Of course, we all have anxiety. We, 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 we have a surplus of anxiety. And the reality is, things that cause us anxiety and, and worry, that they are bound to come. The, the important thing then is, well, what do you do with them? And here we, we have the invitation from God himself. He says, cast those anxieties upon me. You know, that, that picture of, of casting our anxieties upon God, it, it, it draws to mind this this idea of us taking these anxieties, these worries off of ourselves, taking them off of our shoulders, and then placing them upon God for Him to carry, for Him to bear them. Right? That's the invitation He gives them. Cast them all upon me, and, and I will take them. Throw those anxieties upon me, upon my shoulders, and I will carry them for you. 
And what does that mean then, I guess, is the real question. You know, because I, I think the, the rubber meets the road here and asking ourselves, well, how do we do that? How, how do we transfer those anxieties from our shoulders and then place them on God? And the way we do that is by our trust. By trusting in his love, by trusting in his care, and trusting in his plan. And expressing that trust by humbling ourselves under his will and plan for our lives. And by expressing that trust in prayer, in a prayer that says, Lord, not my will, but, but your will be done. Because you know better than I. And just notice here that, that God's word, it's, it's really calling for specifics. In other words, it's, it's not just calling for abstract trust. As if to say, well, yes, I believe that God is trustworthy, generally speaking. Or generally speaking, I believe that God, things is, is, that God is going to work things out for my good. No, it, it, God is calling for specifics here. Lay your specific anxieties upon him. And trust that he cares about those specific individual anxieties. So trust. Trust that he cares. Trust trust that he cares about your financial well-being. Trust that he cares about your health. Trust that he cares about about the college graduates who are missing out on their graduation ceremony and and who are entering a workforce at a very uncertain time. Trust that he cares about the mom who is who was going stir-crazy as she's stuck inside her home with all of her children for almost three months now. right? Trust, trust that, that God cares a, about your loneliness. Trust that, that he cares about your health and your well-being. Trust that he cares about your lost income. Trust that God cares about all of those things dearly because he cares dearly about you. And how do we know that he cares? Well, that's obvious, isn't it? We just got to look to the cross and look to the rock solid and firm care and commitment and love that he demonstrated there. And then just ask yourself if God showed that love to me there, if he showed such sacrificial love for me when I was nothing but a lost, worthless sinner, should I think that now, now that he has washed me clean and made me holy in his blood, Should I think that now his love and care and commitment to me is going to be lacking? Of course not. Trust that he cares. Trust that that, that he cares, again, about all those specific things, that he cares about you individually. Trust that, that he will lift you up when everything else around you seems to be falling down. Trust that he has a plan when nothing seems to be going according to yours. Trust that he cares. And in that trust, cast all your anxieties upon him. And so that's the first step. The first step that our our lesson points us to in our preparedness is to have this humble trust. And then the second part of this preparedness that our lesson points us to is to be on guard against our enemy. Our lesson continues with Peter's warning. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. You have a fearsome enemy in the devil. Here he is compared to a a lion, to to the king of beasts, to whom all nature fears. And his goal and his aim is to kill and to destroy. What the devil wants is is to lead souls away from Christ and to drag them into the the pit of misery that is hell to suffer in agony with him. That's that's what our enemy wants. That's what he's after. And and we have a sober warning here for us to not underestimate him. Don't be so foolish to think that you can stand against him on your own. Don't be so foolish as to think that you can just toy around with his temptations. He is dangerous. And our enemy, he is relentless. So know that, that, that when we are, are stuck inside our homes, isolated in our homes, well, know, well, the devil, he's there too. And he is there, and, and he's trying to get us to, to turn our hearts from thankfulness to cynicism. Know that he's there, and, and he's trying to, to lead you to take out your frustrations upon your family with, with short, hurtful, angry words against them. 
Know that he's there and he's seeking to, to lead you into fear and into doubt. I know that he's there with you at your computer to lead you to go to those sites you shouldn't go to. Or he's there with you to, to lead you to have one more drink when, when really you should be done. And know that whenever it is that, that you feel as though you've hit your absolute lowest point, again, know the devil is there. And he's, and he's speaking and saying the same thing that Job's wife did. Curse God and die. There is no hope. But Peter warns us of our great adversary. He warns us of his danger. But then he tells us, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Now, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on lions, but does this seem to be like a good defense to you? Just imagine, imagine you are in an open field and there is a lion crouching down in the grass in front of you. His muscles are tense. He's, he's staring at you in the eyes, looking as if any moment he is going to pounce. And he is going to tear apart your flesh with his teeth and claws. So imagine you're in that scenario. And you have a friend who shouts out some advice from a safe distance away. Re- resist him and, and stand firm against him. Right, are you going to appreciate that advice he gives? Probably not, because it's not going to do you any good. You stand firm against a lion, it's not going to end well for you. So, how can Peter say this? He just told us that Satan is this devouring lion, and then he says, stand firm against him. How can Peter say that? Well, he can say that because this lion has already been slain. He can say that because Jesus has already crushed our great adversary upon the cross. The the devil's greatest tactic, his greatest weapon, is really to accuse. And in fact, that's what the name or title devil means. It means the accuser. And that's exactly what he does. He accuses us of our own sins. He heaps upon us a a burden of guilt. He seeks to drag us into despair and to try to convince us that when we have sinned, well, then there is no hope for us, so there's nothing else to do but just to keep on sinning. But Jesus has taken away that weapon from the devil. He has taken away the devil's power to accuse because there is no sin that Satan could throw back in our face that Christ has not already paid for at his cross. He has already defeated and crushed this lion. And so there is a greater, there is a a better alternative to more sin and hopelessness because not only does our Savior say, cast all your anxiety upon me, But he says, cast all your sin upon me as well. Throw all of it. Throw all of your sins upon me because, he says, I have already borne their weight. I have already paid their punishment because I care for you. And the same love of our Savior that led him to go to that cross is the same love that now leads him to give us the strength to stand firm and to resist the devil. Know that when you are standing in front of that ferocious lion crouched down in the grass, know that you are not standing there alone. That you are standing there just completely clothed in the the might of Christ's victory. That you are standing there with the double-edged sword of God's word in your hand. And you are standing there with the Spirit of God himself in your heart, giving you courage and strength. So stand firm. And if you're not convinced yet, That God has given us everything we need to be prepared to face all of the trials and temptations in this life. If you're not convinced yet, well then listen to the last verse because it tells us even more. Our lesson concludes, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. There are many trials and temptations and difficulties in this world. Things that that cause us worry and anxiety, they abound. But the God of all grace has already called, called you to eternal glory. 
Right? That eternal glory that Christ has won for you, it is already your possession in faith. It is already yours. Now, now we're still waiting for the full reception of it, but that full reception is guaranteed because the very God who has called us to that eternal glory is the same God who promises here that he will make you strong and firm and steadfast. And he strengthens your faith by feeding it and nourishing it with his holy word. He makes you steadfast as you cast your anxieties upon him and humbly trust in him. And he lifts you up and he sustains you through the gospel of his forgiveness again and again. And through our God, we have all that we need. We, we, we are prepared and we have victory no matter what we face in this life. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll join in confessing our faith together and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll continue with prayer. We include in our prayers uh, a prayer for Stephen Pritchard, uh, who is being deployed next Sunday. Uh, he's first going to Texas, uh, and then from there he, he will be deployed uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, so we include a prayer for him and his family. Um, we also have a prayer for, for Betsy Hom, who graduated from uh, Martin Luther College this weekend and uh, received a, a divine call into the, the teaching ministry. We pray. Almighty God, your protection is over your people in every situation of life. With this confidence, we ask for this blessing of protection over Stephen Pritchard as he serves in the armed forces of our country and is soon to be deployed to Afghanistan. Guard his faith in Christ, his Savior, and permit no temptation to harm him in any way, but strengthen him for the experiences that he must face. Protect his body and health. Let nothing harmful happen to him as he carries out the work assigned to him in service of his country. Especially if his duties call him into areas of great danger, be with him, O Lord, and protect him from all evil. In your mercy, Lord, remember also his family and friends. Lighten the pain of parting from them and, and be their trust concerning his well-being and help them always to commend their cares to you in fervent prayer. And Lord of the Church, we pray also for Betsy Hom and the rest of the, the Martin Luther College graduates who received divine calls to be teachers this, this weekend. We thank you for these gifts that you have given to the church in calling and sending out teachers to feed your precious lambs. Grant Betsy the wisdom to use faithfully the gifts that you have given her to fulfill her ministry. May she be a blessing to her new congregation in school uh, just as she has been a blessing to us. Give her peace and relieve her fear with the assurance of your presence and care as she begins this new and exciting chapter in her life. And we continue with the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.